So with me, I have Kevin Ellis, who is also known as the Bone Coach. So Kevin is a certified integrative nutrition health coach, podcaster, YouTuber, bone health advocate, and he is the founder of bonecoach.com. And so after an osteoporosis diagnosis in his early 30s, Kevin realized just how challenging it could be for the average person to make sense of what needs to be done to improve and how to move forward confidently with a stronger bones plan. And so today, not only has he transformed his own health and made continued progress on his own journey, but he's now dedicated his life to helping women with osteopenia and osteoporosis gain clarity and confidence that improving is possible. And so through a unique three-step process and world-class coaching programs, Kevin and his team of credentialed experts have helped people in over 1,500 cities over the world get confident in their Stronger Bones plan. And his mission is not just to help one over 1 million people around the globe build Stronger Bones, but it's also to help our children and grandchildren have the education, resources, and nourishment needed to prevent osteoporosis and other diseases in the future so they, they can lead a long, active life. And you know that's what we're all in here for. And and Kevin, it's a pleasure having you here. Well, thanks so much for having me here. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's it's great to chat with you. And uh, why don't we just dive in with your background and just if you could just please let us know how you got started on this journey, you know, helping women with osteopenia and osteoporosis. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of times it's not when you hear about osteopenia or osteoporosis, you're not thinking about the 30 year old male right? You're thinking about the woman, 50s, 60s, 70s, or maybe the grandma or the mother that maybe had fractures or was hunched over, had a dowager sump, or is walking with a cane or something like that. You're not thinking about the 30-year-old male. Um, and so for me, I was even shocked when I was told I had osteoporosis because uh, for you know the great majority of my younger years, I was really active. I went into the Marine Corps. Um, I spent five years in the Marine Corps, got out of the Marine Corps, and then I had all these health issues that kind of came to fruition and came to the surface. And I had high stress, poor sleep, uh, really poor energy. I could barely even get out of bed some days. I had all these other health issues that started taking place. And then I found out I had celiac disease. So for those of you that are not familiar, celiac disease is an autoimmune condition where the villi, these nutrient absorption centers in your small intestine become damaged when you consume gluten. And for me, I was, my villi were becoming damaged and blunted to the point where they couldn't do their job. They couldn't absorb those nutrients that I needed, the minerals, all those things that were so important. So my body still needed those minerals and nutrients to execute its daily functions. So it went to the bones, which is our greatest source of mineral reserves and pulled from the bones. And then it only makes sense that I was subsequently diagnosed with osteoporosis right around 30 years old. And I was, it was actually a physician's assistant. It wasn't even a doctor I was working with at the time or none of the other doctors had said, Hey, let's go do a bone density scan. And you've got celiac disease. It was actually a physician's assistant who asked me, has anybody done this? And I said, no. And they're like, okay, let's do this. And we just both thought it was going to come back as normal. Um, and when I got the results back, it said, uh, they actually sent me a letter in the mail. They didn't even call me or tell me or do anything else. They sent me a letter in the mail and said, you have osteoporosis go on a gluten-free diet. And that was it. And I remember opening that letter and reading it and the blood just drained from my face. I had like tingles, you know, and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, what does this mean for my future? Especially after I started Googling, what is osteoporosis? What does this mean? And all I saw was fractures and, uh, you know, a medication dependence, you know, for the rest of my life, it was scary. And at that point in time, I didn't mention this before, but my father, he passed away at a really young age uh, when he was 35 years old. And at the time that he passed away, I was two months old. And so my entire life, I had this fear that I was going to follow in his footsteps to an early grave and not be there to be a father for my own kids. And that was my biggest fear in life. And I had a young daughter and a son away. And I basically thought, you know, I was headed down that path. I was living a, a living nightmare. And, um, I realized at that point, like I have to do something. I started doing a lot of reading and research, consulting with people, spent a lot of money on foods and supplements, and just about everything. I have an osteoporosis atlas. It was the most expensive book I ever bought on the topic, but I have just about every book on the topic. And it was, uh, 
I, I don't recommend it to anybody, but I, this is the level of research I was going to, to figure things out. And I started getting the right plan in place. I improved my health, improved my bones. Uh, and I realized it's not the average 30 year old male that needs help. It's the woman, 50, 60s, 70s, that's told they have osteoporosis and they're presented with calcium, vitamin D, go for a walk, take a bone medication. We'll see you in one year for your next bone density scan. I'm going to tell you right now, that's not enough. And that's the reason why I became bone coach, became a uh, certified health coach, built out a team of credentialed experts, and have now launched a program that uh, called the Stronger Bone Solution that's helped people in over 1,500 cities around the world. Uh, and, and launch bonecoach.com. So that's really my journey uh, getting into and becoming bone coach. All right. Well, that's some story. And obviously cutting out gluten was important for somewhat celiac disease. So it was a piece of the puzzle, but you did a lot more when it, when it comes to uh, just not in the past, but even currently to maintain healthy bones now, correct? Absolutely. And it's so, it is so much more than just going gluten-free, um, a gluten-free, if you're, if you're celiac, gluten-free is a must, right? That's not a non-negotiable or it's not a negotiable thing. It's not like, Oh, I'm gonna eat a little bit of gluten here and a little bit of gluten there. Um, and I'll be okay. No, you just got to remove that from your diet completely. Yeah. Now, when it comes to osteopenia versus osteoporosis, I'm sure if some listening know the difference, but then there might be some people who have heard of osteoporosis, but maybe not familiar with osteopenia. Can you, so can you differentiate between the two? Yeah. So osteopenia, let's even, t let's just talk about what is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis literally means porous bone. It's a condition characterized by either not enough bone formation, excessive bone loss, or it's a combination of the two of those things. And in osteoporosis, both your bone density and your bone quality are reduced, which is going to increase the risk of fracture. Now, the way you find out you have osteoporosis is through a bone density scan, also called the DEXA scan. And this is dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry. It's a painless test, kind of like an X-ray, but very low levels of radiation. And you lay down on a machine, the machine does a scan, and it tells you your bone mineral density, the actual mineral content of your bone. And then what it does, it generates a score. And that score is called the T-score. And the T-score is telling you how much your bone mass differs from the bone mass of an average, healthy, approximately 30-year-old adult. Now, if you have a score of plus one or minus one or any, anywhere in between there, that's considered normal and healthy. If you have minus one to minus 2.5, that's considered osteopenia, also called low bone mass. And that is like a precursor to osteoporosis. And if you have negative 2.5 or lower, so negative 2.6, negative 2.7, so on and so forth, that's considered osteoporosis. Now, the greater that negative number becomes, the more severe the osteoporosis. Most people are getting a DEXA scan, most women especially, in their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, as a check in the box, their doctors are going to order them. But in my opinion, or they may not order them. You may be listening to this and be like, I haven't even had one yet. Uh, and that's not uncommon either. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you have not had one, get one, right? You, you want to get this objective information and you want to get a baseline from which you can monitor future changes. And the other thing is, is if you had a parent or somebody, somebody that you know that had osteoporosis or had a lot of fractures in their future, and you're just avoiding getting that information because you don't want to know, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not a good strategy, right? We don't want to avoid doing something just because we don't want to know what the answer could be. So what age do you recommend starting as far as getting a DEXA scan in the 30s or even earlier than that? I, I would... I always recommend, especially the women that I'm talking to in their 50s and 60s uh, and 70s that have daughters, I'm telling them, tell your daughters, go get a bone density scan. You're reaching peak bone mass right around 30 years old. So if you get a, a bone density scan in your 30s, that's a great baseline to have, right? And then you can just monitor future changes in your 40s, your 50s, so on and so forth. Because especially when you get to the point where um, you hit menopause, you're going to have a reduction in hormones that's going to impact your bones. And you can, you, you can lose up to 20% of your bone mass in a five year period after you go through menopause. So um, really, really important to know that. And a lot of people just don't understand that. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. And so 
obviously more common in women, which is why you focus on women, but you know, you're a guy and you got, ex you, you know, you got diagnosed with osteoporosis. So I'll just quickly ask, should men also consider getting uh, bone density scans? Because, you know, I'm, I'm going on 52 this year and I have never gotten a bone density scan. So this chat makes me think, well, maybe I should get one. Yeah. Men should absolutely get their bone density scan too. Uh, it's not just women are not just affected. Uh, women just, at least we know primary osteoporosis is related to a decrease in estrogen and postmenopausal women. Estrogen has a protective effect on bone when estrogen levels decrease as they do during menopause, that causes an increase in the activity level of cells that break down bone. But there is a whole nother cause of osteoporosis called secondary osteoporosis. And this is where osteoporosis occurs as a result of behaviors, disorders, diseases, medications, and other factors. Men, a lot of times will fall into those other factors. So especially if you've got overt digestive issues, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, you know, even th thyroid conditions too, like, or maybe you were taking specific medications for a long period of time. And I can talk specifically about what some of these things are, but you can, your bones could have been impacted. For me, 30 year old male, former Marine, you would never think uh, with a background in weightlifting, you would never think that I would be told I had osteoporosis, uh, but I was. And it was a total shock. So it's always good to get that information, know where you stand. And then the younger you are, the more, thing, the more things you have in your favor. It's not saying the older you get, it becomes impossible. That's absolutely not, not the case because you can build bone strength at any age. It just becomes more challenging. The older you get and the more bone you lose, there are fewer cells involved in that process. That process becomes less efficient. So uh, we want people to be on the side of prevention, not reaction, and to get that objective information as early as possible. Uh, the other thing I'll mention about men is that, and this is just an observation that I've, I've come across, is that men are more likely uh, to suck it up, right? To just see this as like a suck it up condition. I, I'm tough, you know, I can handle it. Trust me, this is coming from a guy who thought he was pretty darn tough for quite some time. I'm telling you right now, this is not a condition that is one of those that you just kind of suck up. Um, so that's that's really important to make sure you, you objectively figure those things out. Well, let's go over some of the more the, the causes. You said you might go over some of them in greater detail. So you mentioned some of the medications. Obviously, you know, as women, you know, go into menopause. So can you can you dive a little bit deeper? Absolutely. So let's even start with because we're because I know you talk a lot a lot about thyroid, and you and I did a specific podcast on thyroid too that we can we can refer people to also. But let's even just talk about thyrotoxicosis. That can be a contributor, and and that refers to having excess circulating thyroid hormones. Um, so that could be hyperthyroidism, right? Overactive thyroid that occurs when your thyroid gland produces too much thyroxine. Uh, and, and it, it can also, uh, you could have thyroiditis inflammation of the thyroid gland, iodine induced and, and drug induced thyroid dysfunction, and then excessive intake of thyroid hormone in patients treated for hypothyroidism that can also be a contributor too. So uh, these can be some of the things that are contributing from a thyroid perspective to, to, um, you know, bone loss, but let's talk about some of the other more common ones as well, because these are, uh, there are medications specifically that some people aren't even aware of that can contribute to bone loss that they've been taking for quite some time. One of which is our, our glucocorticoids. This would be your prednisone and your cortisone. Glucocorticoids, they're steroid medications that are designed to suppress inflammation. And what they're doing is they mimic natural steroid hormones produced by your body. They're, and they're often used to treat conditions like asthma, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And, and the reason they contribute to bone loss is that number one, they're reducing the gastrointestinal absorption of calcium, which is increasing the urinary excretion of calcium. And that's also going to lead to a calcium deficit, right? So you're you're not absorbing, you're excreting more, you've got a calcium deficit, the primary mineral of your bones is calcium. But then the biggest impact are that glucocorticoids act directly on the cells that break down bone. They're called osteoclasts. 
to increase their lifespan and it ends up reducing bone density. So that's a really big one to be aware of is that if you are taking that medication or considering taking that medication, it will contribute to bone loss. Another one, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are class of drugs typically used as antidepressants. There was a review of 19 studies on the effect of SSRIs on bone that, that show they have a negative impact on bone mineral density and they increase the risk of fracture. And then also antacids. Okay. These are drugs that reduce the production of or increase the suppression of stomach acid. And a lot of times when people are considering taking these medications or they are taking these medications is they have heartburn, they have reflux. Uh, and a lot of times when you have those things, it's because you have too little stomach acid. And a lot of times people take these medications to suppress what little stomach acid they do have. So this would be your omeprazole, your Nexium, your Prevacid, your H2 receptor antagonist drugs like ranitidine, ranitidine and Zantac. Um, and what's happening is the reason that's a problem, suppressing stomach acid is a problem, is you need stomach acid to properly break down and extract nutrients from your food, like amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Your bones are 50% protein by volume. You need a constant supply of amino acids, um, calcium, magnesium, iron, B12. If you have low stomach acid, your, your body's going to be starved of these nutrients. You're not going to be getting the nutrients that you need. So, uh, and, and long-term there are pl plenty of studies that show that just using these medications is not going to be good for supporting your bone health and could have a negative impact. So that's really important to understand. I already talked about gastrointestinal or GI conditions. Celiac disease is a big one. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Those are also big ones too. And then in terms of autoimmune conditions, uh, when we're specifically talking about autoimmune conditions, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, that's one that, that primarily affects the spine and the vertebrae. Uh, then also rheumatoid arthritis. That's one where the, the body's mistakenly attacking the joints and that's create, uh, and creating inflammation that's that inside the tissues and joints that also can lead to bone loss. Uh, and then lupus is another one. That's a big one that can, that can contribute to bone loss as well. So, and, and really anything that's contributing to inflammation in the body is going to be fueling those cells, those osteoclasts, it's going to extend their lifespan and they're going to be continuing to break down bone and it's going to contribute to bone loss. So. Yeah. I think when we chatted, um, when, when you interviewed me, I, I spoke about that too, because the research I did when I was looking at the impact of, or Graves and Hashimoto's thyroid autoimmunity on the bone, it actually showed that the inflammatory process from those conditions has a great effect. So it's not just the thyroid hormone imbalance, but so that obviously translates to other inflammatory conditions, other autoimmune conditions as well. So I meant, I'm glad you mentioned that as mentioned that as well. And, and so medication. So let's talk about medication that they typically use as a treatment for osteoporosis. We you spoke just before about some of the meds that could increase the risk of osteoporosis, but you said that if you go to a conventional medical doctor, they'll recommend calcium, vitamin D, walking, and then some, some meds. So can you talk about the, the risk versus benefits of the, the meds that they give for osteoporosis? Yeah, this is a great topic because it's going to come up, right? If somebody is diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, they are going to, they're going to have a bone medication recommended to them. Most likely at some point, I would say 90, 95% of the people I talk to that that's the situation they're in. They get diagnosed in a 15 minute window. They get their bone density results back. They're told they have osteoporosis and then here's your medication. And it, there's very little education around the big picture with medication. So let me give that education to you right now. I'll give you a really high level of it. Um, there, the first thing I want to point out is these drugs, these bone medications, they're not like taking an aspirin, right? They have a dramatic effect on bone physiology. That's the first thing we have to understand. Then there are two different categories of drugs. There are anti-resorptive drugs, which are designed to slow down the, the resorption or the breakdown part of the remodeling plot process. So they're reducing the rate of bone breakdown. Um, and then, then also that's going to reduce bone formation also. Then we have another class called anabolics, and I'll talk about those in a minute. 
So anti-resorptives, this would be like your bisphosphonates. So Fosfamax is a common one you probably heard of, or rank ligand inhibitors, Prolia is one that you probably heard of. So with bisphosphonates, uh, there are a lot of side effects that come with bisphosphonates, a bone joint, muscle pain. One of the biggest ones I hear from people is digestive issues. Uh, and if you have digestive issues, you're probably gonna have issues absorbing your nutrients too. Uh, and then some of the, some of the side effects that can happen, they happen less, but osteonecrosis of the jaw is a big one that occurs when that bone, that jaw bone begins to starve from lack of blood. Basically you have cells in the jaw bone that can start to die. Um, and again, that's, that's rare, but it's something to be aware of too. That's important to understand. Um, but the biggest concern with these bisphosphonate drugs is that the safety and efficacy of the drugs are from patients who took them for less than five years. Okay. And I, I have people come to me sometimes that have been on these drugs for eight years or 10 years, which is, that's a long, long time. And the reason that's a problem is because as, as you and I are going about, as all of us, we're going about our daily lives, doing our activities, we're starting to get these tiny little micro cracks in our bones, right? That's, that's normal. And then what happens is we have these cells in the bone that send out a signal and they say, Hey, we've got damage to the bone and we have these bone resorbing osteoclasts that come in and scoop out that damage. And then right behind it, we have these osteoblasts, these building cells that come in and form new bone that's stronger and healthier. What happens is when you're taking anti-resorptive medication, if you slow down the activity level of that cell that's scooping out the damaged bone, over time, you can start to accumulate that old, worn, damaged, weakened bone. So that's one of the that's one of the most important things. It could that can ultimately lead to a loss of structural integrity and strength in that bone. Um, and a lot of people don't know that, right? So when they're starting this out, the other point is if you start something like Prolia, which is a rank ligand hit rank ligand inhibitor, if you come off, you can't just come off of Pro, Prolia, you know really quick because what happens is it can actually increase your risk of vertebral fractures. So that's something, again, you, you need to understand that if you're, if you're starting out on a medication, there are implications later on for you stopping that medication. And it could require another medication after that. Now let's talk about the other class of medications called anabolics or category of medications called anabolics. And these are drugs that are designed to build bone and build it faster. So they're stimulating the formation part of this bone remodeling process. And what happens is more bone ends up being formed than is taken away. Now, usually the people that are recommending these drugs are those that have had low or no trauma fragility fractures, right? They've got really poor quality bone and they need a medication to help them build good quality bone. These drugs can help build that bone um, and they can help build better quality bone. But what you have to understand about these medications is that you have to follow them. Number one, you can only take them for a certain time period, uh, 13 months to two years about. And then after you finish it, you have to follow it with another drug. You have to follow it with, with an anti-resorptive. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose all that bone that you just spent years of time taking medication for. Um, so, And I've seen situations where people that had no business being prescribed an anabolic medication were being prescribed an anabolic medication. Um, so it's, it's really, really important for people to understand, you know, you may be getting into a point where you're going on this endless cycle of medication and not even knowing it just by starting out with that first doctor's visit. So it sounds like there might be a time and place for the anabolic medication. It's just that if they, are on it, you don't, you're you, typically they're on it. I think you said 13 months to two years, and then they have to take the other medication, you know, to maintain what they've built up. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, and I would say most of the people that are coming to us, they're trying to do everything they possibly can naturally before considering the medications not option. But there are situations where some people have had five to 10 or more fractures, which is an indicator of really poor quality bone. And a lot of times you need, there may, in those situations, there may have to be a, a quick intervention, which could be necessary and life-saving in, in some of those situations. So I, I am not pro-medication. 
Uh, I am not, you know, saying, you know, you should take a medication. I'm saying you need to make an educated and informed decision. Uh, most people don't need a medication at all when they're prescribed one. That's my personal opinion that I've, I've seen. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessary, but there are some situations where that may be necessary and life-saving. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Obviously you want to try to do things to address the cost of the problem. And these people aren't deficient in any of these medications. There might be some situations where it's really extreme and they, maybe yeah. it's a good idea for them to take it. But then if someone, let's say if someone's listening to this and they're already on an anabolic, uh, one of those an anabolic um, drugs, I assume they could switch gears if they want to and just take more of a natural approach. Obviously, you're not going to tell them to stop taking the medication, but if they make that decision on their own, they could they could um, stop taking it on their own or under the guidance of the prescribing doctor. For sure. And again, like this is not me giving medical advice here specifically for any individuals because we are talking about the medications here. But I will say if you're on an anabolic medication, um, if you've already started it and you've been on it for any length of time, you, you're going to need to follow it with an anti-resorptive medication. And otherwise, the, the entire reason you're taking it is going to be washed away, right? You're going to lose everything you gain because what happens is when you take an anabolic, yes, it speeds up the cells that build bone and build it faster, but it also speeds up the cells that break down bone because you got to in order to build new quality bone, you got to speed up the cells, uh, the osteoclast too. And if you don't slow down that train, that's what's going to happen after you come off of that. But um, we have plenty of people that have been on maybe an anti-resorptive medication, uh, like a bisphosphonate or something that are like, you know what? I don't think this is the right fit for me. If Fosamax was not the right fit for me. They decide to stop using it and they're, they end up being just fine. Uh, again, that's not me telling anyone here uh, specifically in your situation, but I would say, um, most of the people that we encounter, they don't, they can do a lot of things naturally, uh, to build stronger bones and set themselves up for an active future. So speaking of doing things naturally, let's talk about food and are there any, yeah. is there any diet or specific foods that can help to improve bone density? Um, I really like to, and whenever I talk about food, I always like to start out by saying, I, there's no one single dietary approach for every single person, uh, you know, or one specific set of foods that are only good for every single person. Now there are some uniform things that I would suggest to most people. Number one, uh, you've probably beat this down and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and put one more nail in this coffin, sugar right? Reduce your sugar intake. It's key for bone health. Sugar is going to damage your bone by triggering an inflammatory response. It's going to lower your vitamin D levels. It's going to deplete bone healthy minerals like calcium, magnesium, copper, uh, copper and chromium. Uh, it's going to inhibit intestinal absorption of calcium, and it's going to block the absorption of vitamin C. Vitamin C is key for maintaining a healthy skeleton. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, any, any, your breads, your cakes, your cookies, your crackers, your pizzas, your pastas, all that stuff breaks down to sugar. That's not going to be the best thing uh, for your bones. So make better swaps, you know, get those things out of your life if you haven't already and find better alternatives uh, for some of those things that are your favorites. The other thing that I would say is chemicals. If you can get food that's organic or you can get it from your local farmers and you go to your farmer's market and you say, just ask them at the table when you're at your farmer's market, do you spray? Like ask them if they spray chemicals on food and they'll tell you a lot of times if they do or not. So ask those questions. And, and then in terms of the, you, you can always go to the environmental working group. They've got dirty dozen clean 15. That's going to tell you if you're on a budget where you can get the most bang for your buck for organic, like strawberries, like don't ever eat non-organic strawberries. <laughs> don't ever do that. Or berries in general, those are going to be laced with uh, lots of different chemicals. So we want to make sure we, we look at that list on environmental working group. That'd be, that'd be a good starting point. Then in terms of general uh, dietary principles, your dietary approach, if you are looking to, you know, handle an autoimmune condition or you've got Hashimoto's or you've got 
um, you know, Graves disease or something like that, your dietary approach, you're probably going to be working to put that autoimmune condition into remission, right? So your dietary approach may be different than somebody who is not working to put an autoimmune condition into remission. Uh, so that's, those are just some important things I like to preface when I start talking about food. Now, there are some foods that I found that are pretty universal for most people that work really well for a lot of people. First one is fish, but not just any fish. I would talk about uh, fish with the bones in them. And this would be like canned fish. So non BPA lining, right? We don't want the, the BPA, but like fine. Sardines, 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 mackerel, wild sockeye salmon. You can find wild sockeye salmon with the bones in. The reason you want the bones in is because these bones are a natural source of not just calcium, but all the other minerals that your bones need with the right cofactors and the other nutrients in nature's perfect form. So it is a great source of calcium and other minerals. The other reason I like these is because they've got protein. Protein breaks down to amino acids. And as I talked about before, your bones are 50% amino acids uh, or protein by volume. So you need these amino acids and also to support uh, muscle building, muscle and bone have a really important relationship together. We can talk about in a minute, uh, but you need to be able to support stronger muscles and that's why you need additional protein. Okay. And the other part of the fish that I like, especially these canned fish is that they're easy to take, to go. If you're hiking, you're out doing activities, you're on vacation, throw them in a pack. Don't open them on the airplane. They smell horrible. People hate you for it. <laughs> <laughs> you get, you know, you get fish juice on yourself. I'm not really making the case here for, for mackerel and, and sardines. I know that, uh, but they've also got omega threes, right? And these are fatty acids that uh, can help dampen inflammation. Again, like, like Dr. Eric and I were just talking about anything that contributes to inflammation contributes to bone breakdown. So that's a, that's a big star for me. I really like that one. Uh, another one of my favorites, arugula. Arugula. I've been talking about arugula for years. It's a leafy green, same cruciferous family of vegetables as broccoli and kale. It's rich in potassium, folate, vitamin C, vitamin K, and calcium. All of those are important for bone health. And you can get great bioavailable source of calcium from arugula. And there's actually a, there's a, this is super interesting. There was a recent clinical study that found a bioactive compound in arugula called aricin that helps turn off osteoclast, those bone breakdown cells, which is awesome. It's amazing. I didn't even know this when I first started consuming arugula. Now I, I, it just confirmed like arugula is a great food for a bone healthy diet. And the other reason, there's two other reasons I really like arugula. The other one is that it's a bitter food and we are, our diets nowadays are, you know, void of, uh, they don't have a lot of bitter foods in them for the most part. And the reason why we want bitter foods in our diet is that they stimulate bile production, bile flow. Uh, and bile is produced by the liver. It's stored in the gallbladder. And when you're consuming foods, it's, it's going to help break down your foods. Uh, and, and so it's a really important thing to have in your diet is bitter foods. And then the last part of this is that arugula, unlike spinach, common green that a lot of people use, arugula is low in oxalates. Now, I don't ever like to vilify uh, other than, you know, eating a bunch of candy and stuff. I don't like to vilify specific foods usually. Um, so spinach has a great, some great nutrients and things like that in it, but it's, it's high in oxalates. And oxalates are an anti-nutrient that bind up bone healthy minerals like calcium, and they're going to prevent you from absorbing them. So if you've got digestive issues or kidney stones, arthritis or joint pain, those can be some indicators that you have a hard time breaking down and degrading that oxalate. So, and you might not have the intestinal bacteria also oxalobacter former genes. You might not have that to break it down also. So you can swap spinach for the arugula. So uh, if, if you need any other reasons of why arugula should be added in your diet, give it a shot. Um, and then one of my other favorite ones, there are quite a few, but one of my other favorite ones are vitamin C rich foods. You heard me talk about earlier why we shouldn't consume sugar because it's going to block the absorption of vitamin C. Well, vitamin C is super important for general health. I think we all know that. But if you remember, our bones are made up of this collagen protein matrix upon which minerals are laid. 
what vitamin C does is it stimulates pro-collagen, it enhances collagen synthesis, and it stimulates something called alkaline phosphatase activity, which is a marker for osteoblast bone building cell formation. That's pretty cool. Um, and some of the best fruits, berries, you know, citrus fruits like lemons and limes, kakadu plums, acerola cherries, those are all great ones. And then in terms of vitamin C rich vegetables, you know, for, for those with autoimmune conditions that are trying to work to put them in a remission, you probably don't want to be eating the peppers. Red and yellow bell peppers are, are great source of vitamin C, but they're also a nightshade. So if you're on an autoimmune protocol, you're not going to be consuming those, but there are other sources too. You can get uh, dino kale or lacinato kale, uh, lightly steamed broccoli, um, you know, Brussels sprouts, those kinds of things. You can, you can incorporate those. So um, there are also, those are some other good options to, to start incorporating into your plan. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing those foods. And, you know, a number of years ago, I used to stuff my smoothie with spinach and then I did a test from Great Plains Lab, the, the organic acids test, which looks at oxalates and my oxalates were definitely high. And that was, I mean, there were other high oxalate foods I was eating, but that definitely was the top oxalate food. And so that was the main change I made. I cut out the spinach and um, did add arugula, but I can't say I've eaten that as regularly as I should have, because I didn't realize how much calcium it has. But, you know, I try to um, diversify when it comes to the, the greens and the other vegetables. But I did a retest of the Great Plains Lab. And sure enough, the oxalates decreased just with that change alone. I mean, I was eating probably more nuts than I should have been eating, which are higher in oxalates. But I can't mm -hmm. say I completely avoided the nuts and, you know, berries, raspberries higher. And anyway, so you can't completely avoid you know, the oxalates, but the spinach is a big culprit. And you're right, you know, it doesn't mean that people can't have spinach every now and then, but there are people that were are doing what I was doing years ago, you know, either stuffing their smoothies with spinach or just having a lot of spinach in other ways. And it has a lot of calcium, but like you said, not the bioavailable type of calcium that's found in other foods. So thanks, thanks for sharing. I do need to incorporate more arugula into my, my diet. Um, and I want to, I want to touch on one other thing here, because I think it's important. You highlighted something that's really important is that, and I, I was trying to trying to also talk about, you know, I don't like to vilify specific foods like that could have healthy nutrients and things like that, or it could be in a dish that you're going to consume infrequently, because what I don't want people to do is develop a fear around, you know, oh, there's a spinach, some healthy paleo spinach casserole or something that somebody made for Thanksgiving. And they're completely avoiding something that uh, they, they would possibly enjoy because it has this one food in it, right? Same thing with beets. Beets, they're high oxalate. Cacao and, and uh, dark chocolate, high oxalate. You can still enjoy those things from time to time. Don't but if you have issues with oxalate, you know, you, you just, you're not going to be eating those every single day. Yeah. But again, some are real, some are higher than others. So when I attended actually some of the Great Plains laboratory workshop, they said spinach by far is the highest oxalate food. And uh -huh. even if you cook it, it might decrease the oxalates a little bit, but it's not going to lower it from being, you know, like a high oxalate food to a lower one. It's still going to be a high oxalate food. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, I agree. There's, even with spinach every now and then and or beets and sweet potatoes are high. So you could drive yourself crazy trying to completely eliminate oxalates, but you, A, you won't be able to do it, but then you, you know, B, you don't need to do it. So, so again, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And so you mentioned muscle, the importance of muscle when it comes to mm -hmm. bone, um, bone density. So can you talk about exercise and like what types of exercise I'm, I'm guessing resistance training based on what you just said? Absolutely. So, so exercise and bone health are exercise is super important for your bone health. Um, a lot of times what's important is if you've got younger kids too, this is important for them because you, by the time you turn age 18, you've put on 90% of your bone mass. So as you're younger, you're building, you're in these years that you've got a great chance to build a solid foundation for the rest of your life, uh, with your bone health. And that's why gymnasts, you know, get your kids in gymnastics, get them playing sports, soccer players that do a lot of running in multi-directional ways. They've got stronger bone, uh, stronger bones in their legs. Um, 
the reason for this is that your bones need two different types of stimuli. They need muscle pulling on bone and you need impact. And the most effective interventions are using one or both of those in combination. So you need muscle pulling on bone to become stronger. So you've got this mechanical signal sending a chemical signal to tell those bones to become stronger. Uh, usually what you're going to be told to do if you're in the doctor's office and you're told you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, they're going to say, go do some weight bearing exercise or go do some walking. You know what? Walking is great for your health. If you're doing it now, keep doing it, but do not count on that as your only form of exercise. You need to do more than that because it could help you maintain your bone density uh, in certain areas of your body, but it's not going to help you build bone density. Okay. So you need to incorporate other weight bearing exercise. And when I say weight bearing exercise, I mean, that's where your muscles and your bones are working against gravity to keep you upright, right? There are exercises you're doing on your feet that doing that on your feet, where you're working against gravity, you're placing stress on your bones. That's a good kind of stress that we want. So this would be like you're running, you're jogging, you're hiking, you're dancing, you're gardening, playing tennis, uh, aerobics, jumping rope, climbing stairs, playing soccer with the kids or the grandkids. Uh, all those things are included in, in weight-bearing exercise, but it also includes things like Tai Chi and yoga and Pilates, uh, dancing. Those kinds of things can also be weight-bearing. So if you're doing those things, keep doing them, right? That's great. Now, there are also some things called non-weight-bearing exercise. Let's talk about that because this is where you're not, uh, your body is not working against gravity to keep you upright. You're not placing that stress on your bones. And this is the same situation that astronauts that go up into space are in, where they're not having that, we don't have gravity working against us to place that stress on our bones. And they end up losing bone density over certain periods of time. So we have to actively work against that. So the exercises that we could be doing, non-weight bearing, uh, would be cycling, kayaking, uh, seated stretching or seated exercises, or the biggest one is swimming, right? Swimming is a big one. And what I'm not saying is that if you're doing these things now, if you're riding your bike or you're swimming, uh, or you're putting, and you're putting in some laps in the pool, or you're doing some kayaking, that's great. If it makes you happy, if it reduces your stress, do it, but don't overdo it. And don't count it as your only form of exercise because it's not going to be enough to stimulate what your muscles and your bones need. So then what is the other type of exercise we have to incorporate to give our bones what they need? Muscle strengthening exercises and resistance strengthening, uh, resistance training, basically. So you, this is where you're using dumbbells, resistance bands, could even be your own body weight if, if it gives you that level of intensity um, or even barbells too. And you may be thinking like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, muscle strengthening. I have to be a bodybuilder. Or, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be in that position. Um, you just have to be able to do these exercises at an intensity that stimulates your muscle and your bone. Uh, so what intensity level is that at? Well, the studies that show the greatest effect on bone, that's in the five to 10 repetition range. And some of the studies that uh, there's been a lot of work by a woman named Dr. Belinda Beck, there's been some other research out there, but they looked at things like overhead press, deadlifts, squats, chin-ups with drop landings. Uh, those were all effective. Um, and again, if you're listening to this and you're like, I can't, I've never done a squat before, right? I've never done a deadlift before. That's so intimidating. Well, don't go on YouTube and just look, up, look how to do a deadlift and try to go knock out some sets. Don't do that. But just understand it may, it's okay to expand what you may not be familiar with. Just do it safely. Find somebody who can help guide you through that. Get your proper body mechanics down. Make sure you're doing the right things. And let's slowly, slowly progress you to the point where you're actually building muscle and bone strength. Uh, because this is not a quick fix. Uh, bone health is not a quick fix. It's not like if you get two good workouts in every other week that your, your bones are going to be stronger uh, and like noticeably stronger. This is a long game. Play the long game with, uh, with your bone health.
So you spoke about certain foods and just covered exercise. Uh, do, do you have time to go over supplements a little bit? Just, you know, of yeah. course, I'm sure people are wondering about the calcium. I know you don't recommend like high dose calcium supplements. So if you could talk a little bit about that and, you know, vitamin D and some of the other supplements you might recommend. Yeah. Yeah. So vi vitamin D super important, right? It's super, super important for your, not just your overall health, but your bone health too. Uh, obviously it's not just a vitamin, it's a hormone right? It induces the transcription of more than 50 genes. It increases the intestinal absorption of calcium. It promotes higher bone mineral density, uh, and it's going to help lower fracture risk. So it's super, super important for our bone health. N your best source of vitamin D is going to be the sunlight, midday sunlight, UVB radiation, bare skin, no sunscreen, five to 30 minutes a day when in those warm months, or just enough not to burn. If you can go longer, that's great right? That's great. But um, I would say that's the bare minimum for your best source of vitamin D. But most people aren't even getting that in the warm months. We're covered up, right? We cover up in our, our hats and our sleeves and our chemical laden sunscreens. So for sunscreens, when you get to the point where you've already gotten your sun just enough to the point where you're not going to burn, maybe you use a mineral-based sunscreen after that, right? And that, that would just be a, a sunscreen tip. Um, but in terms of dietary sources, you can also get vitamin D from salmon, herring, sardines, anchovies, oysters, egg yolks. Egg yolks are also a source. Um, and then with supplementation, you never want to supplement blindly with vitamin D. You always want to test your levels. So you want to test your 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, uh, and if you're in the winter months, if you're going into fall and summer or fall and winter, wherever you are, there's a good likelihood you're going to, you're going to increase the level of supplementation that you would be, you would be using to maintain a healthy level of vitamin D. Um, so the, the, it, it's an important one to incorporate into your plan for sure. Uh, vitamin K2, this is one that not everybody knows about or not, not too familiar with, but let's talk about it because it's super important for your bone health. You've probably heard about vitamin K and maybe K1, right? But K2 is important because it aids in bone mineralization formation by activating something called osteocalcin. And this is going to ensure that calcium is deposited in our bone and not our soft tissues like the arteries and the kidneys. So the, it, it, great sources would be, if, if we're talking about K2, uh, there are different forms of, of K2. There's an MK4 form, there's an MK7 form. The MK4 form is going to be found in beef liver, grass-fed ghee and butter, dark meat chicken, pastured egg yolks. Those are all great sources. Emu oil is another one. Uh, and then MK7 is going to be found in things like hard cheeses, fermented foods, sauerkraut, kimchi, natto. Natto is actually the greatest source, but most people are probably not going to be eating a lot of natto. And then this is a really interesting one is that bacterial fermentation in our guts can actually help produce vitamin K2 as well. So uh, that's, that's super important. And if you can't, if you're not getting enough K2, most people aren't consider supplementation there as well. Um, vitamin C, I talked about how important that was. Obviously we want to try to get as much vitamin C as we can from our diet and through our nutrition. Sometimes that's not possible. So incorporating that into your plan could be helpful. Calcium, when it comes to calcium, I am a big fan of get as much as you can through your diet and nutrition first. Absolutely. First and foremost, get it in those, the forms where it's got all the other nutrients that you need. I do find a lot of times though, that people are still falling short or they're having a hard time making sure they're getting uh, calcium into their diets. So in those situations, usually the maximum I would want to see somebody incorporate is 500 milligrams a day not all at one time, maybe spread out, you know, in two different meals or something like that. Uh, and, and use an absorbable form of calcium. <clears throat> um, any of the ones bound to an organic acid or amino acids, those can be helpful. So your malates, uh, you know, citrate is a highly absorbable form, but then also MCHC calcium, which is like bone meal, basically, uh, that can be helpful too. So, uh, and then if we're, we're talking about a controversial topic, dairy, right? Let's talk about that one. Because if we have an autoimmune condition, dairy is most likely not going to be a part of your plan, right? Especially initially too. But if, 
if you are, or somebody in your family or your kids or whoever, if that is a part of their plan, uh, for bone health specifically, I would say cultured dairy, fermented dairy, that would be the way to go, right? So if you're going to incorporate it, make sure you're getting some additional benefits from it. So the benefits of fermented and cultured dairy is that you've got the probiotics, you've got beneficial bacteria and yeast that come in large, like significant quantities that can help your gut, uh, help your gut health. But then also they could, uh, they could lead to better nutrient absorption and things like that. So, um, those are my thoughts on, on calcium. And then another big one that I'll touch on is magnesium. You've got to have magnesium. Magnesium is so important. It's 300 functions in the body. Uh, you need it to, to, uh, build proteins back inside your body. I talked about how important proteins were, but in order to rebuild anything inside our bodies, you need magnesium to do that. So, uh, you have to be able to, if you want to rebuild stronger bones, magnesium has got to be part of your plan. And also as you're increasing your calcium and your vitamin D, your need for magnesium increases also. Uh, so super important there. Uh, I would say those are some of the biggest ones. And then omega threes, I touched on that before, but if you're not eating uh, healthy fatty fish, get some omega threes in your diet, omega three fish oils, get them in a bioavailable form. That's going to be, those are all going to be good things to incorporate. So with the dairy, so you mentioned, you know, healthier forms of dairy, like fermented dairy, mm -hmm. if someone's going to eat dairy, but it's optional, you would say. So if someone's eating plenty of arugula, let's say in other, you know, vegetables higher in calcium, maybe the fish with the bones, then there's no need for dairy. Would that be correct? Yeah. I mean, if you're, especially to, if you are also supplementing to, like if you're adding in a little bit of supplementation to that can help you, right? If you, if you're eating a can of mackerel, for example, you may be getting 250 milligrams of calcium from those bones, maybe a little bit more, maybe 300 milligrams of calcium. How many cans of mackerel are you going to eat in a day? I can tell you, I eat quite a bit of mackerel and sardines and stuff like that. I I'm, I'm at my limit at about two a day, right? <laughs> so that, that right there, that's 600 milligrams. So then let's say I add in three ounces or 85 grams of arugula. That's one of those big plastic clamshells full of arugula. That's 200 milligrams of calcium. That's a pretty significant volume if you're eating a raw salad. But if you saute that down in some, some good quality olive oil, uh, that can compress or make it a little bit smaller to consume. So you've got 200 milligrams of bioavailable calcium there. So now we're at what, 800 milligrams. Now we're starting to try to figure out some of the other sources that we can bring in calcium to our diet. So um, cruciferous vegetables, if uh, th those have a pretty good absorption uh, rate for the calcium within cruciferous vegetables. Um, yeah, but incorporating usually there's going to be some supplementation that takes place or happens for most people just because they have a hard time from a practicality standpoint, figuring out, and from a convenience standpoint, figuring out how they're going to get enough into their diets. All right. Well, you shared so much great information and, uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, there are people that just want to know more. So can you let us know where can people find out more about you, Kevin? Yeah. Well, you can always find me over at bonecoach.com. Uh, that's where we've got, you know, stronger bone solution coaching programs. Uh, we've, we've helped a lot of people program is featured in Forbes and a lot of other places. And we've had even medical doctors, physicians, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, surgeons, orthopedic surgeons come through our programs and refer their patients to us after. So we've got physicians spending their own money to learn about bone health outside of the pharmaceutical treatments and then referring their patients to us, which honestly, that is, uh, I'm really proud of that. And I'm really happy to see that, uh, because I think we've got a long way to go in our conventional system. So if you want to learn how to build stronger bones naturally, uh, and you want to do it the right way, head over to bonecoach.com. But what I want to do for your audience, Dr. Eric, is I want to, I've got a free stronger bones masterclass and this is where I would encourage every single person who's listening to this right now, if you're worried about your bones, if you're worried about fracture, you've got parents or somebody you know that has osteopenia, osteoporosis, forward this on to them, help them out, listen and make them listen to this podcast 
and uh, then get them to sign up for that free Stronger Bones Masterclass. And we'll put this, can we, you think we can put this in the show notes maybe? Oh yeah, definitely. I will okay. make sure the, that link is in the show notes. Because this is so, so important for people. And what I'm going to do is also, if you sign up for that Masterclass, not only will uh, you're going to get the awesome information that comes with it, I'm going to send you the replay uh, so you can watch it at your own convenience whenever you want. And I'm also going to send you a Bone Healthy Recipes Guide too. So uh, sign up for the free Stronger Bones Masterclass in the show notes. Uh, and that's, those are the best places to find me, get a hold of me. All right. Yeah. I, I need to sign up to get that free bone <laughs> recipes guy. <laughs> I'll send it so, to you. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, you know, it was great chatting with you, Kevin. Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise related to bone health. Uh, really do appreciate it. Happy to help. Happy to help.